This is a production of Cornell University. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, kind of title doesn't say much, I suppose. And this research grew out of my PhD work. And it was uh, kind of a chance discovery. And to give you a, an idea of how I ended up working on this and why, why we ended up going down this, I'm going to give a little bit of background. So my PhD was on natural genetic variation in photosynthesis. And uh, basically, the rationale behind it was to look at what variation is there to see if we can find, we, we were doing GWAS and a couple of other things, genes relevant for this variation, which potentially could be used for improving crops and the likes. And in order to do that, we had to come up with a way of phenotyping photosynthesis, which is not so easy. It's kind of an elusive phenotype. So we developed this system which could measure 1,440 plants in less than an hour for photosynthetic efficiency. And it could also measure a couple of other things. So as well as photosynthesis, which we measured using chlorophyll fluorescence, which gives us these kind of images here. Uh, we also measured uh, growth rate, which for Rhabdopsis is pretty easy because it's got this flat architecture. So you can just get an idea of plant size by measuring projected leaf area. And from this, we got other information, such as leaf movement. And that's because, as you can see here, more or less with the pointer, uh, these leaves, uh, the plants are getting bigger and smaller. And that's not because they're actually getting bigger and smaller. It's because their leaves are going up and down. So you get a lot of other information from these plots. And also, we had a spectral uh, filter. So we were able to measure at specific wavelengths of light, which gave us an idea of different <coughs> pigment content in the leaves, uh, anthocyanin, chlorophyll, things like that. But today, I'm going to focus on photosynthesis, uh, not on what was the primary research, but one of the spin-offs of this. So I measured this population of plants, or Arabidopsis, collected from all over the world. So we had uh, 700 accessions genotyped with 214,000 SNPs. And uh, took quite some time even to measure that number, because we did a lot of replicates and to have good, robust data. And this was the phenotypic distribution that came out of it. And as you can see here, we have this nice normal distribution here of all the individuals. So here on the x-axis, we have photosynthetic efficiency. And uh, on the y-axis, we have the number of individuals in each bin. And it, but we have these guys down here, which were really different from everybody else. And it turned out that these uh, plants were all of one particular genotype, which had considerably reduced photosynthesis. I was pretty excited when I first came across this, because I thought, oh, this is really cool. We found something new. And then when I looked into it, I discovered somebody had already published on this, except it had a different accession name. So we didn't know it was in our collection. And what it was was a genotype which was herbicide resistant. It was resistant to triazine herbicides. Uh, this plant had been collected in the 1980s in a railway track in England. Uh, and uh, basically, it had been in the stock center since then. And one of the cons what this herbicide does is it targets uh, the photosystem 2 unit of photosynthesis. So it, it hits this protein here, this uh, photosystem protein uh, D1. And what happens normally with this D1 protein is that plastoquinol binds here and gets it's the primary electron acceptor which moves electrons down into the linear electron transport pathway. Uh, and what's important for binding is this serine here. You see there's a hydrogen bonding site. And atrazine gets in there as well, these, or any of these triazines, and blocks this pocket so that the electron transport flow can no longer work. The plant has an energy crisis, and it dies. So the herbicide is very effective. But the mutation, which has evolved actually in 72 different species, so it's a great example of convergent evolution, results in this serine being substituted with a glycine. The atrazine no longer bonds efficiently, and the plant becomes resistant to uh, this herbicide. But a consequence, of course, is that the plastoquinol also doesn't bond as well. So the photosynthetic efficiency is greatly lowered. So that was that, basically. And we, we had this plant, which was uh, uh, herbicide resistant. And uh, basically, um, you know, it had already been described. So that was fine. But one of the problems was, and I think I actually took this slide out, which was silly. Um, it had a big in, uh, reduction in growth rate efficiency as well which basically I come up with a way of swapping the chloroplasts around. So what we have here is we have the normal wild type, which has this reduced photosynthetic efficiency of 16%. But we then gave it a wild type chl chloroplast, and we get this increased growth rate of uh, 87. Sorry? Can you define the efficiency in uh, photosynthesis? 
Oh, uh, it's so it's a chlorophyll. So it's photosystem two efficiency. Um, it's a good proxy for carbon dioxide assimilation rate. It's, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. So it goes up to units of the maximum possible efficiency for dark adapted leaves is 0.83. So it goes from zero to 0.83. It cannot go any higher than that. And usually plants under steady state conditions, so adapted to light growth, are operating around mm, between 0.6 and 0.7. And these guys are down, uh, in most cases, around, depending on the light intensity, around 0.4, 0.5. So they've got a, a considerable drop. This was at very low light levels. This was at 100 micromoles of light. So the actual efficiency in photosynthesis drop is only 16%, but it has a big impact on growth rates because the plants are, when they have this reduced chloroplast efficiency, effectively uh, working at probably their light compensation point. So the point at which the energy input is only just about enough to keep the plant going. So its growth rate is, is very much so compromised. Uh, is that, did that answer your question? OK, so um, the problem with this was that I wanted to use this data for genome-wide association mapping. And genome-wide association mapping works fine when you're loci are on the nuclear genome. So I had uh, these 214,000 SNPs all located on the nuclear genome. However, this mutation is in the PSBA protein, which is chloroplast encoded. And when I included this genotype in my uh, GWAS approach, it completely messed up the results. So I got lots of false positives. So this is what was keeping this genotype in my mind, because, and I did some other research to overcome this issue. But it was always there. It was kind of a thing that was bugging me. And I discovered this at the beginning of my PhD, found out it had already been published on. But it was still fresh in my mind. And I happened to be in Norwich, here in England, giving a talk. And Ely is nearby. And this was the wrong time of the year. This is August. This is not the time of the year that you go collecting Arabidopsis. But I, you know, had a spare couple of hours, I grabbed the train, and I went down to Ely Railway Station. Now, most people had thought, the people that originally published this knew it was collected, 1988 it was collected, uh, but the herbicides, triazines, were banned or discontinued in Europe in 1992. So everybody assumed this thing had died out. And I was kind of curious to see whether indeed it had died out, and if it was still there, what was the frequency? And it would be a nice example, I thought, of studying photosynthesis in the field. Here we have a, a mutant which occurred in nature with a reduced photosynthetic efficiency. How does it interact with plants with higher photosynthesis? Because there's a lot of debate in the world of photosynthesis whether it actually is limiting for plants or is it something that the wild plants really need at a high level? And we thought we could answer a lot of interesting questions. So I went there to Ely Railway Station. I looked around, and it was the wrong time of the year, but I found these little skeletons of dead plants with a couple of s seeds still stuck on. And I was pretty excited about this. Um, and I brought them back to the lab. And this is a picture of the railway station. Here we have the station here, the railway tracks, and this is going into the city. And I found plants here in the car park. And I tested them to see if they were resistant. And like I said, most people had thought that it probably would have died out. And they were all resistant. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. This is interesting. It's still there. Let's go back. Now, the assumption at this point was that it had originated in Ely Railway Station, and that uh, because that's where it was first collected in the 80s, and there was no reason to think otherwise. So we had these grand ideas of doing transects away from the railway station, seeing how far it spread, and what was the interaction between resistant and non-resistant genotypes. Now that the selective advantage was removed, the herbicide was no longer in the environment, and uh, how much of a cost is this reduced photosynthesis in nature? And when I went back then in May 2013, because I basically convinced my supervisors that this was something we had to do, so they were willing to pay for that. Um, this is the Rabidopsis growing in the railway ballast here, and here is just some sampling. Uh, we went back again to Ely. So here's the railway station, which I showed you a picture of before. And we started sampling all over the town, or we tried to. We couldn't find any Arabidopsis outside the railway station. Well, we found a couple, but we were like walking around this town for two days, looking at every corner, and we really couldn't find anything. And we really, I was really disappointed. I was like, well, where is all the Arabidopsis? And then we did a little bit of research into the history of Ely. And it turns out Ely is actually a clay island, which was surrounded by fen or bog. And Arabidopsis doesn't really like clay, and it certainly doesn't grow in bog. And these fens had already been drained in the past 100 years. so. It was not prime Arabidopsis territory. And you'll notice down here, so this is the railway track coming down. We had one plant collected also along the railway track, just a bit further away, because we walked down this road. And that plant was also resistant. 
So then we started thinking, so Ely Arabidopsis is probably not native to Ely. It probably came in on the railway tracks. And railway tracks are good Arabidopsis habitat. They've got sand, they've got rock, and they're relatively free of competition. So we thought, well, it didn't originate here, and it must have come from somewhere else. So let's sample along the railway tracks and see if we can track out where it came from. So we went back a month later, and I, did, I basically just took lots of trains all over this part of England. <laughs> and we, I sampled all these railway stations which I regretted that in the end. I should have rented a car because the trains don't go all very often and sometimes you spend two or three hours in some dump somewhere, no way out. <laughs> and uh, which happened in this place, Kennet. I hope nobody's from Kennet. I've stuck there for ages. Uh, anyway, so went around collecting and I found the Rabidopsis pretty much in all the railway stations, almost. And then all of these places, there were resistant genotypes. So this resistance had spread quite far, and we had no idea actually how far it spread because we didn't go beyond, like it hadn't stopped. So we got really interested in this and thought, well, this must have spread all over the place, and we're not going to be able to track it down because we don't know which direction to go in. There's not enough information from this where it came from. So we thought, well, let's have a look at what's available in the genotype databases and see what's related to this resistant individual that we have genetic markers for. We had 214,000 markers. And there was this regmap panel available of 1,307 plants, all of which had been genotyped with these uh, 214,000 markers. So we did basically a relatedness uh, uh, assay, and we had this one genotype which was much more closely related than anything else to this resistant individual. So we thought, OK, that's a good starting point. Where is this genotype from? And this genotype was from here, Ledbury, in basically near the Welsh border in England. But Ely is here. So they're quite far away. So we thought, hmm, maybe, maybe it really has spread very far. And then we thought, well, what else can we do? What other information can we use to get an idea of where this originated from? And we thought, well, there's another genotype data set. It's got a lot more plants, almost 6,000, but it's got a lot less markers. But still, we might be able to get some information from this. So we basically plotted the possible origins. So all these yellow dots are where genotypes were collected from. And this color, so dark means less likely to be from there, and white means more likely. So we had this hope that we would get a nice idea of, the and th these purple lines, by the way, are the railway tracks, of where it came from. As you can see, it's not very obvious. This is not very informative. There's a few locations where we're pretty sure it's not from. But other than that, it could be from anywhere here. Uh, even it looks like it could be from northern France, which I don't believe. Uh, so this didn't work as well as one would, ho one would hope. But in this set of 6,000 lines, there were four that were identical for all 149 markers to the Ely genotype. And when I checked them and I genotyped them for the mutation, every single one of them was resistant. So they were the same plant from the same mutation event. So this was pretty interesting. And where they were from was even further away. It was down in Cornwall. So it's about 400 kilometers as the crow flies <coughs> between these two locations. So we thought, well, we want to investigate this a little bit more, see how far it's really spread. So we'll do a sampling strategy around this area of southwest England, because we had these two data points pointing us in this direction. So we went back again. We did a lot more sampling along railway tracks here. We have an actually a herbicide, not triazines, of course. They don't spray them anymore, probably glyphosate or something, or abidopsis along the railway tracks. And we went to Ledbury as well. And uh, we were a bit disappointed. Um, so in total, including the sampling in the east of England, we had 573 plants collected. And in total, we got 52 resistant plants. But in the southwest, apart from the place where they had originally been collected from, or these six, four individuals in this panel of 6,000, we didn't find it back there. So it may have gone extinct, although that railway station was being renovated at the time. So the place was completely destroyed. and. We didn't find much in the way of Arabidopsis in the actual station. But I did find it out here in Worcester uh, independently. So we do know that it has spread quite considerable distances. Again, all these brownish lines are railway tracks. And this is the original area that we sampled. And you can see there's quite a lot of plants from there. One thing that was interesting about it was that it was completely associated with railway tracks. So when we sampled, we sampled on railway tracks. And we always went away into the town and tried to get non-railway track samples. And never did we find the resistance away from the railways. So it was 100% association with the railways. So this was something that evolved on our new railway track and then spread all around the place. So the next question was, well, was this a single event? So we had these 52 plants collected from different parts of England. 
was it one mutation event or did it evolve multiple times? Because bear in mind, this mutation has evolved on 72 separate occasions in different species. So it's something that seems to evolve relatively regularly in response to triazine application. Um, we just did a simple, we didn't use a lot of markers. I, I don't think we needed them. We had 32 uh, SNPs spread across the genome. And we genotyped all of the 500 plants to get an idea. And every single resistant individual was down here. So they were all completely identical for all 32 SNPs. So for me, this was pretty convincing that it was one mutation event which then spread. And this is where the hitchhiking comes in. Because then we started thinking about this. And what does this actually mean? Um, and I'm going to explain genetic hitchhiking just as a refresher for those of you who are not familiar with it. And this is genetic hitchhiking in the nucleus. So here we have basically a, a piece of DNA. And each of these lines represents different individuals in a population. The colorful blocks represent SNPs or polymorphisms with reference to one another. If one of these individuals gets a mutation which is beneficial in some way, and then it starts rising in frequency, you get what's known as a selective sweep. And this would be the post-selective sweep population. So you see that, obviously, this is much more common because it adds a benefit. But the interesting thing to pay attention to is that these polymorphisms, which provide no direct fitness advantage, have also risen in frequency. And this is because of this physical linkage to the selected locus. They're literally linked physically on the DNA. And this is classical genetic sweep. But it does depend on physical linkage and the classical understanding of it. And that all occurs in the nucleus, because you've got these big chromosomes and you've got recombination there. However, our mutation is on the chloroplast, which is obviously not physically linked to any loci in the nucleus. Yet we had complete fixation of these nuclear genomes. So these nuclear genomes had arisen to this frequency purely on the back of this chloroplast mutation. So they had basically, as I said, hitched the ride on this chloroplast. Um, so as I said, genetic linkage is something which is generally assumed to occur in uh, only when things are physically linked. And it's restricted by recombination. It's a very important phenomenon. And it's recently been shown to resolve Lewontin's paradox, which is this. Uh, basically, according to neutral theory in evolution, there should be a linear relationship between population size and uh, genetic diversity. But that is not the case. The larger the population, the lower the genetic diversity is compared to what one would expect. And this has been recently, I mean, it's been often considered that selection is the cause of this. Selection will operate more efficiently in large populations. And because of this physical linkage, when you get selection, you get a region around it which is reduced in diversity. So basically what you're happening, it's called genetic draft. This, when hitchhiking occurs across the whole genome, the phenomenon is genetic draft. You're dragging the diversity down. This does happen in larger populations. So it's a very important phenomenon, but it's always assumed exclusively to occur within the nucleus. There's no literature considering how selection on organelles could affect nuclear diversity. And that's because there's no physical linkage. So I think people don't re really think about it. Here we're showing that there has been very strong selection on an organelle, which has resulted in a complete change in the diversity of the nuclear genomes in these populations of Arabidopsis. Now, this is probably because Arabidopsis is highly inbreeding. So you don't have a physical linkage, but you have a statistical linkage. And how important the level of inbreeding is compared to the intensity of selection is something that we don't know, but we're thinking about. So basically, what I'm showing is something very simple. But what's interesting about it is that it hasn't been observed before, and it hasn't really been considered in the literature. How does selection on organelles indirectly affect nuclear genetic diversity? And this, I think, is particularly interesting because it's becoming more and more obvious that there is indeed a lot of selection on organelles. So if you look at southern hemisphere beech trees, nothophagus, the, uh, basically, the diversity of the organelles doesn't match up with the diversity of the nuclear genomes. The diversity of organelles shows a latitudinal gradient. Some organelles are better adapted to different temperatures. And these move actually between species. The nuclear genetic diversities don't match. So you've got strong selection on these organelles for adaptation to these different climatic zones. And if you have such kind of selection, you potentially, as we show here, can have linkage these processes could cause distortions in nuclear gene frequencies, which is basically what I'm getting at. Um, the question is, does it require inbreeding or any level of inbreeding? And this will require modeling to go forward with this. So in summary, the main point I'm getting at is that selection on organelles can affect nuclear genetic diversity. And so a lot of people that I've tried to explain this to found it a bit confusing and wanted me to illustrate it better. So I thought about it quite long and hard as how to show this in a sort of sophisticated and clear way. 
and I came up with basically this figure, which I think aptly shows how the organelles can distort nuclear gene frequencies. Um, and that is basically what I wanted to show to you today. I've gone through it a little bit fast, I see. But uh, there are some remaining questions, things that need to be addressed, of course. So how common is this? Um, and I think this is a particularly interesting question. We were very lucky. So we stumbled upon this, which was what I was trying to get at the way I told the story. We were not looking for this. We were I was interested in photosynthesis, and then we came across this phenomena. We knew the selective agent. We knew the locus which was uh, providing resistance. We had all this prior information. Then we had this nice system of railway tracks, and we had the region where the selective agent was applied and where it wasn't. So it's very clear that selection was occurring on the chloroplast. There is no doubt about that. And then we were able to see that the nuclear genome had hitchhiked along. But when you actually know that the chloroplast is under selection, the selective agent and, and the site of selection is pretty rare. So if you don't have the prior knowledge we have, how would you be able to find these phenomena? Which I think is an interesting question, because almost all of the population genetic studies looking at uh, the effect of these kind of uh, selective sweeps is exclusively looking at diversity in the nuclear genome, and they pretty much ignore what's going on in the organelles, even though they can be under selection a lot. So basically, how do we detect it? And what are the evolutionary consequences of this? Does it distort nuclear genetic diversity as much as we now realize genetic draft operating within the nucleus can distort nuclear genetic diversity? How big an impact can it be? Because like I said, it's becoming more and more clear that there is a lot of selection operating on organelles. And if this selection is also distorting nuclear gene frequencies, what kind of consequences could this have for evolution? Uh, like I said, it can lead to a loss of, and another thing is the intergenome conflicts. So th these organelles have to communicate with the nucleus. It's a very tight relationship to regulate all of this. So if you've got one organelle increasing rapidly in frequency due to selection, uh, then the associated nuclear genomes, if any of them are less well adapted to this, then you can have also distortions there. Um, so that's basically it. I've, I've, I've gone faster than I expected probably skipped something. Um, I didn't do this alone, of course. I've got, uh, this was stuff, like I said, that grew out of my PhD research. So my two supervisors, Mark and Jeremy, a promoter, Martin Corniff, who uh, basically uh, made sure that I graduated. And then uh, help in the lab from Frank and from Bas. These two guys helped me out with like just basic stuff in the lab, helping along. And then a lot of the analysis I did with a guy called Jost van Heerwarden, which was very, very helpful. And uh, yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope that maybe you have some questions or comments. We'll leave it at that. A little bit more of the molecular mechanisms on this, how the environment and the gene uh, of the organelle interact that drives the selection. Like what? What's the interaction? Well, so does it. In, in, in brief, there's like trains that spray herbicide. So that's the, that's the environmental pressure. They have these special trains that they designed that drive along railway tracks spraying herbicide to keep them clear. Uh, so this is the selective pressure, effectively. And then you, it knocks out photosynthesis. You get a simple amino acid substitution, which provides resistance. Uh, and then this plant is occurring on a railway track which has these trains moving, non-railway uh, herbicide spraying trains moving up and down it. And they, there's been quite a, a lot of evidence to show they produce these wind effects which dis distribute seeds, people get them stuck in their shoes. So there's lots of way for it to disperse along railway tracks and different railway stations. So I think that's how it actually spreads. So I think it's a nice example of congruency between human-induced chemical changes and human-created infrastructure providing uh, avenues for changes in genetic diversity <coughs> and populations. Yes, that one's clear, but I was uh, more interested in the molecular and cellular, where this gene has um, interacted with the pressure because an organelle that, that was selected, driving the selection. So, are there other examples in uh, mammals or other plants that essentially organelle driven evolutionary changes? There is evidence, there's plenty of evidence of selection occurring on organelles, but this is the first time anybody's ever, and this is why I'm telling this story, anybody's ever considered that the selection on the organelle can distort nuclear gene frequencies through this effective linkage. It's a statistical 
thing. It's not a physical or a biological connection. It's just by chance. This it's a stochastic effect. This organelle occurred in this nuclear genetic background. The nuclear genetic background got a free ride. Um, the am I answering? Is this, yes, is this yes, what you're yes. looking for? Yeah. So because there is evidence of organelles being important for lots of things. In plants, they're important for water use efficiency. So there's been really nice studies done using um, reciprocal transplants of uh, uh, sunflowers, which have, they've introgressed basically, they've made a reciprocal rill populations, so reciprocal segregating populations, and they've been able to show that the cytoplasmic background, I don't know whether they were able to show it, because it's difficult to disentangle the nucleus, or the chloroplast and the mitochondria, because they're always inherited together, at least in most organisms. And uh, they were able to show that these had a big impact on, for example, survival to drought. And it was an example of local adaptation of these. So that was like really nice empirical studies. But then you also see, like I mentioned with the Southern Hemisphere Beach, you see these like really nice uh, latitudinal stratification of different chloroplasts, but not of the nuclear genome. Because uh, the chloroplast, the mitochondrial genome duplication as well, or? But in the evolution of genomes, sometimes you have these triplicate and quadruplet of genomes. Do you see any duplication of the mitochondrial genome? It, well, I mean, it does happen. You have, uh, what is it? The, is the plant species with this massive mitochondrial genome? I think it's Silene, uh, which just expands dramatically. But are you wondering about like when polyploidy happens? Or I'm yes, not really following. Yes. Well, polyploidy is just something that happens in the nucleus because my mitochondria and chloroplasts already are effectively polyploid because there's many copies of them in every cell. So, I don't know if I fully understood. I got, I got you. Thank you. Okay. What about the heteroplasm? Like, I can imagine a situation where you have both the wild type and the mutated, and that would be advantageous for a plant to have both of them. That's a really good question, um, and we never found it. So I checked for heteroplasm. Uh, we never found it in a Arabidopsis, but it was a nice science paper published in, I think it was the late 80s or early 90s, I forget exactly when, which has almost never been cited, interestingly. Um, which uh, they showed that, um, what was the species, uh, Senecio, had uh, heteroplasmy for um, resistant and non-resistant chloroplasts. And it had a way of maintaining this heteroplasmy, which is most interesting, because a lot of people studied heteroplasmy in tissue culture in the 1990s, and then they did these protoplast fusions. And then you get like a, a mixed um, bag of organelles. And almost always it segregates out rapidly. So you get one br branch which has one particular chloroplast, another branch has another. Mitochondria are a bit more promiscuous. Often they actually mix their genomes, and you get these hybrid mitochondria. But chloroplasts don't do that, at least the rich literature I've read. So usually, there's, the assumption is that heteroplasmy is never really maintained. It's lost out during mitosis. But this organism was able to maintain heteroplasmy. Then, interestingly, when they subjected it to selection, so for example, uh, strong herbicide application, it went to uh, homoplasmy of resistant genotypes. And it never went back after that. So obviously, the non-resistant ones had gone extinct somehow. But in the absence of the herbicide application, somehow it was able to maintain heteroplasmy. Nobody's ever really followed that up, and that's the only known example. Our case, it's, it's not. not I have another question. So uh, you didn't go into this, but at the beginning you showed the plot with the uh, photosynthetic efficiency, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems to be a complex trick. And you said that you wanted to do GWAS, but you never really got into. You actually went into looking at nuclear uh, genes associated. Yeah, that would be in a different talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, to answer your question, yes, indeed, uh, I did GWAS. We found some loci. Um, it was, uh, I was talking to Jean about this earlier. Um, it wasn't, it was like, I don't know, has anybody here done GWAS on complex traits? Yeah, you've done it? Were you happy with it? Happiness is hard. Okay. <laughs> so uh, basically, my answer would be, was pretty, for me, I thought it was a bit disappointing, probably because it was oversold to me and I was very gullible and believed all of the stories I was told. But um, in the end, most of the large effect loci, like the large effect loci we found, had already been found for disease resistance, but it affects photosynthesis because it gives an autoimmune. Uh, uh, basically, the plants start killing their leaves before other plants. So you see this coming up as a massive reduction in photosynthetic efficiency. 
We did find other loci, but I didn't manage in the time I had to like <coughs> follow them up and characterize them fully. But they made sense in certain genes, and others didn't make any sense whatsoever. But we did find stuff. If that's what you were wondering about. Yeah. I can I can I can help you. I can show you what I found later. But I can't remember all of the sure, sure. codes. Uh, Maureen. Uh, I'm completely on board with your concept that nuclear uh, genes can hitchhike with the organelle. But I'm skeptical as to whether you really have an example of that. And the reason I'm skeptical is that triazine resistance hasn't, triazine spraying hasn't been used that long. So this, um, this plant could have arisen perhaps on your birthday, the day you were born, and then these plants are actually fairly young, like you. So how do we know they've had enough time for the nuclear variation to occur that it, ra it, rather than it simply being that they haven't had enough time to get old and change? So do you have a way to refute my, my skepticism? I have to be honest, I don't understand what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my theory. The reason you're finding all the nuclear genomes the same is they simply haven't had enough time to change, especially since you've got an inbreeding species. I agree. Now, if you have an outcrossing species, then I would agree there must be some reason that they're staying the same. But you have an inbreeding species, these no, plants could be. Sorry, these, I, now I understand your question. Yeah. The okay. fact that they're the same is not a problem for me. Yeah. It, that doesn't mean that the hitchhiking hasn't occurred, it means that the hitchhiking was extremely tight linkage. I think what is interesting is why did we never see outcrossing? Why did we never see a individual which had the uh, s uh, resistant chloroplast, which was a, of a mixed nuclear genotype? And I think the answer to that is we don't have, didn't do enough sampling, basically. I think it's probably out there, but it occurs at a low frequency because, like you say, our abidopsis is highly inbreeding. The fact that we see no differences is a combination of the fact we've only got 32 SNPs. I think if we did whole genome sequencing, we'd see more polymorphisms. 32 SNPs is not a lot, and it hasn't been a lot of time, but that doesn't mean that hitchhiking has not occurred, unless I misunderstood it. No, I, so I guess my point is you haven't proven that it has, is, has occurred because you simply don't have enough time, and Arabidopsis has a fairly low outcrossing frequency. I, I guess I don't know. In England, if, I imagine somebody's measured how much outcrossing happens in nature. And do you have any idea what, per, you know, it's how? It's got an outcrossing frequency between, so, in, so like 0.95 inbreeding to one. So yeah. it's like almost completely inbreeding. Yeah. So that's, that's really what I'm saying. I, I, th I completely believe, believe that the nuclear genome uh, is probably dragged along with, with the organelle genome and under many circumstances since there are protein complexes in the chloroplast that are from both you know, made by, by, from both nuclear and organelle genes, you would imagine that there are some, uh, some reason that you would want to have those <coughs> nuclear genes that fit best with the organelle genome. But I just don't think you have shown it yet with, you know, the amount of data that you have. No, but I'm not suggesting that there is a co-adaptation between these two, this nucleus and this chloroplast. No, I'm not suggesting that either. I'm just, I'm just saying that Unless you have more time and, and more plants and uh, you know more outcrossing, I think it's hard to say that the reason that those nuclear genomes are all the same is because of dragging along the nuclear genome with the organelle genome. What would be the alternative hypothesis? That how else would they be all the same? That there simply hasn't been enough outcrossing, uh, and you haven't collected enough plants to see the ones that have outcrossed. So, you know, you could be you could be right. I just said I would want more proof. Okay. Um. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> no, you can accept that. But I still don't, I don't really get why this, I don't get it, basically. What, the point is that they're all the same. Is That's the evidence. But that's not for me. I'm just saying that your evidence isn't strong enough yet. Because okay. you need more plants, more markers, and, and, you know, to look for whether they really are all the same. Uh, or whether they just haven't had enough time to outcross and, and uh, you know. Okay. I mean, these plants could have arisen in 1990, and... Well, they, well, they were collected in 1988. Yeah, okay, 1988. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Maybe they originated, on, as I said, <laughs> on your birthday. Triazines <laughs> were, were, were sprayed in England since 1960, and most evidence uh, regarding the rate of evolution of resistance is that it happens within a 10, 10 years. Uh -huh. in most instances. So 
probably it was around since the 70s. That's still not a lot of time, but the fact that they're all identical is, like we know it was one event, and this nuclear genome has nothing to do with resistance, yet it has that much higher frequency as a consequence. So that is, per definition, at least how I understand it, genetic hitchhiking. But if another um, population spawned from a single ancestor in 1970, and you tracked that population, and looked at the variation, you know, they both started at the same time and, and mm -hmm. diverged. Would that have as many differences either? Or would that have many differences? Or would all of the genomes formed by that population, or yeah. seen in those populations, look the same? Another way of looking at this is that the triazine essentially extinguished all other competitive nuclear genomes. So there's really nothing left. Even if they're outcrossing, they're still yeah. the same nuclear genome. So you have inbreeding uh, going on in, at an incredibly intense rate. Yes, and that probably occurred when it spread. But now that we go back and sample, these plants occur in mixed stands. With other species? With, no, with other, uh, I mean, other species. individuals. Yeah. So it, the possibility for outcrossing is certainly there. Yeah, but, um, but there was not a possibility of outcrossing for as long as the act is Yes. Well, so, so you really have to find the opportunity for outcrossing um, within the genetically different specifics <laughs> from the time they stopped the actual of the treatment. And when was that? Basically, 1992. Yeah, so, so you basically have 20, at most 25 years for something to explore other nuclear genomes uh, as a host for these mutated so, chlorophytes. So I'm, I'm a I agree with you. The evidence is not that strong. But, but I agree with you. But the thing is that the nuclear genome has already increased massively in frequency. So even as it outcrosses and, and this nuclear genome gets into other organellular backgrounds and vice versa, it has massively increased in frequency. It's a rare genotype. We, as we showed with the relatedness, apart from the resistant individuals, we don't find many plants closely related to this in the whole of England or in northwestern Europe. It's kind of an odd one out. And now it's at a much higher frequency than it ever was before, which is hitchhiking, as I understand it. It could also be seen as a thunder effect. I mean, it's essentially what you have is like a, an island that is a long railway, and it, no one else can live in it. I mean, is there any residual herbicide right now that would remove No, the herbicide's definitely gone. Uh, also because there's species of bacteria which evolved to Egypt okay. as a nitrogen <laughs> source. But, but I mean, it's a, it, you can also see it as a founder effect. I agree with you that it's hitchhiking. But, but the founder effect and hitchhiking are, 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 are two sides of the same coin, as I understand them. It's just the look of association with a particular locus that gives you to a higher frequency or the look of getting on the island first. Mm, the hitchhiking occurs with more uh, individuals that are competing, and I guess I would think of founder effect as a small sample size that goes to a... Okay, but it, yeah, it depends. But around the region where the selection occurs in the genome, it's effectively like a founder effect, right? Yeah. I mean, what, another way to, to really like, go into the data and, and, and really time this out would be to just do a quality sim simulation and just time exactly when that happened. And mm -hmm. we could answer the... the, the well, I would need sequence data yeah. to be able to... you'd have to sequence. But since you have a couple of SNPs, you have an expectation of number of nuclear uh, polymorphisms given a... Yeah, but they're completely identical for all 32 SNPs. Of the nu nuclear? The nuclear genome. 32? Yeah, spread across the genome. So they're, it's, it's, it's completely inbreeding, like you were suggesting. But I think the reason we haven't found any outbreeding is because we haven't done enough sampling. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, need, you need a lot more sampling to be able to find at the rate of outbreeding that it would occur. So, so, okay, so I have research. an experiment for you to do. Okay. All right. You, you showed in your little map that you had some railway stations where there were non triazine resistant and triazine resistant plants. Why not uh, collect seeds and then see if there's any outcrossing? If, if you're saying that the reason those, those plants are all one nuclear genome, uh, is because there's been selection for them. Why don't you measure the rate of outcrossing in those regions where the plants are located? Uh, I'm trying to do that. And if I can get money. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would like to. Um, I did find some outcrossing uh, in the non resistant genotypes. Uh, so there was some heterozygosity in that. So there is outcrossing occurring in these populations. I was just never lucky enough to find one which outcrossed with a resistant plant. 
or, or resistant plant which had any degree of crossing plants around it. And it is compatible. It does make F1 and it's just perfectly cross-pollinatable. So that's not, there's no physiological barrier there to prevent this. No, but maybe there is in nature. Maybe for some reason that plant is less likely to outcross in nature. They flower at the same time, so there's no source of mating in nature. Um, they're all flowering more or less at the same time. I, I, it's possible, of course. I cannot rule it out, but I never found any evidence to suggest that. And my feeling is I just didn't have enough samples. I, I think if I went back and sampled even more intensively with like hundreds of plants from each population, I would find it eventually and I would cross it. I don't remember answering your question properly. I think it was it was tapped on to okay. it as like an example of what Maureen was saying. Um, but I have a different question about something okay. like it's slightly, you know. Um, I'm not saying that this is what happens here, but could you ever imagine a case where you have a chloroplast gene um, that's, so it's not physically linked, of course, to the nuclear gene, but there's a genetic interaction, like the proteins interact, and then you get genetic draft from not the chloroplast gene, but nuclear genes that work well with that chloroplast gene, so then you kind of have this <coughs> chloroplast having an indirect genetic draft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you have something as complex as photosynthetic machinery, could you imagine that happening, like engaging in multiple sites throughout the nuclear genome, and then you can't distinguish chloroplast genetic hitchhiking from like indirect nuclear draft? I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a... Something which, I mean, the best example of that is cytoplasmic male sterility, where you have, and this occurs in the mitochondria usually, um, I think one example of returning with chloroplasts, where you have some, uh, usually uh, PPR proteins are involved in this. Basically, a, uh, the mitochondria evolves to kill the pollen. Uh -huh. so mitochondria doesn't want plants to have pollen, is the rationale behind it. Uh, of course, it's not thinking like this, but it has a selective advantage if it's in a mother plant, because there's more seeds. Uh, and the male sterile plants usually produce more seeds. And then you get more outcrossing as well, so often you get advantages of hybrid vigor and all of that. But of course, as it rises in frequency, more and more of the plants are no longer able to produce pollen, so there becomes an advantage to be able to produce pollen. But this cytoplasmic background is also increased in frequency. So then you get the evolution of restorer factors. And you basically have an arms race between the nuclear genome and the mitochondria. And these PPR proteins, or the proteins that often are restorer factors, show a very similar evolutionary path uh, uh, pattern to uh, pathogen uh, resistance genes. They occur in these kind of cassettes of duplicates and things like that. So it really looks like a sort of almost an immune interaction between the nucleus and the mitochondria. So that is an example of that. In terms of like proteins working together, and in our particular example, so I didn't go into it today, but because this genotype worried me so much because it messed up my GWAS results, I came up with a way, along with another PhD student, of using a meiotic a mutant, a genome eliminator line. Some of you may have heard of this same history line from Simon Chan, uh, to eliminate the nuclear genome. Uh, and I introduced this mutation into multiple cytoplasmic backgrounds, so I made a diallele of nuclear cytoplasmic uh, combinations, complete reciprocal diallele, and I included this resistant genotype. And it works perfectly fine with all other uh, cytoplasmics. So there is no physiological basis for, at least no evidence for physiological basis for this association between the chloroplast and the nucleus. What we're looking at, what I argue we're looking at is a statistical association. Look at this genotype occurred, this nuclear genotype occurred with this chloroplast which got resistant to the herbicide, arose in frequency due to the selective advantage and perhaps the cleared habitat along the railway tracks, got to a very high frequency. The selective pressure is no longer there now. It's occurring in mixed stands. But the damage, so to speak, has already been done. It has done the hitchhiking. It is now at a very high frequency. It has had the benefit of being closely associated with this chloroplast, which is why I argue it is genetic hitchhiking. And the fact that they're identical, the nuclear genomes are identical, which occur at least for 32 SNPs, which occur with this chloroplast, is evidence for that having happened. Yeah? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, please join me in thanking for it. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.